Welcome to the Molding Health Show. Our goal is to leverage the wisdom and experience of healthcare practitioners to set you on a path of self-discovery and healing. These insights, coupled with a multidisciplinary approach to each area of interest, should provide an invaluable resource to everyone looking for a better approach to health. In this episode of the show, we speak to Beanie Otto about disenfranchised grief from a counseling psychologist's perspective. Beanie Otto, welcome to the show. So we're really, really glad to have you on board. Um, Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I mean, it's the pleasure is all ours. And, uh, you know, she has really outdid herself in terms of, you know, finding this topic. And thanks for agreeing to it. But we're going to be speaking about disenfranchised grief. And but before we go into that, because I'm going to let you do the honors and explain what that is, uh, because I'm not even going to try. Um, but um, Shaz, how did you even get in contact with Beanie? To be fair, I connected with Beanie on LinkedIn about a year or so ago. And as I was going through people's you know, interesting topics for the show, I came across Beanie being one of her areas of specialty being disenfranchised grief. And I thought, you know, that sounds really, really cool and interesting. And it's not something that we've covered or that I'd even heard of. So I reached out, sent her the invite, and she came back fairly quickly and said, you know, yeah, it would definitely be something she'd be interested in chatting about. So we set up the interview. That's amazing. Thanks, Beanie, for agreeing to that. Um, so, I mean, before we go into the, you know, like the topic itself, has, um, have you found that that's a topic that, that resonated with you for some reason? How did you even stumble upon that in terms of, you know, that's my special area of interest? So it, it did start with my, my own experience of loss and grief. Um, in 2019 and that's when I started getting really interested in in the topic of grief broadly speaking um, and as I finished my internship I thought you know this would be something that I'd really like to do my PhD on um, and so I started doing my PhD on disenfranchised grief um, but I suppose I suppose you can say it was inspired by my own experience of loss and grief. Okay that's amazing and, and uh, I really like you know, when we make it, um, you know, we, we, we always like stumble upon these things. And it's amazing that you took something that was, you know, quite close to, to you. And, you know, you created something from it and, and also made something better, as in you making the world a better place, you know, by talking about this and being a lot more skilled with it. Um, but not to keep everyone else in suspense. I mean, can you can you break that down for us a bit? I mean, what what is disenfranchised grief? I'm so sorry. I seem to have lost the sound. I can't. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I see you speaking. I just. I can hear you now. So sorry about that. Um, no problem. Can you please repeat the last question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was asking, um, you know, not to keep everyone in suspense. Can you tell us um, what is? Shaz, are you hearing it fine? Okay, cool. Okay, and Bini, on your side. All good. Yes. Okay, cool. I'm going to start from there then. Okay, so not to keep everyone else in suspense, I mean, um, I, I want to ask, so what exactly is disenfranchised grief? Well, okay, so the term was coined by Dr. Dennis Doker, um, and he's an expert on grief. So he, he coined this term in the 1980s. So if you think about the word disenfranchise, this means to deprive someone of a right or a privilege. So in terms of grief, it becomes disenfranchised when the people around the griever deny them the right or the privilege to grieve. So as Doka coined it, uh, disenfranchised grief, sorry, disenfranchised grief is the grief that people experience when their loss is not or cannot be open, acknowledged, publicly mourned or socially supported. So what makes disenfranchised grief distinct from other types of grief is that the loss itself, as well as the subsequent grief that's experienced, goes unacknowledged or unsupported by people around the griever. So people who didn't necessarily experience the loss. Okay, um, so we did a show recently, and it was again from a psychologist's perspective on bereavement. And I think that's the one thing that kind of came from there. And, um, you know, I remember 
uh, I think it was Bronwyn, and Bronwyn mentioned, you know, like you need to um, almost like let the grieving process happen. And I think people always say, you know, like, but you know, you'll get over it. And they, obviously, they mean well. But is that what you is is that what you mean by disenfranchised grief, where you almost like stop the person from from that grieving process? Yes, yes, it does, and it is um, specific to different aspects, right? So. The grievers may not be recognized if the relationship that they had with the person who has passed on or the deceased, um, if that relationship is not recognized, if the importance of the loss is not seen as significant, or if they're not seen as having a need or you know a right to grieve. Um, so then society really attempts to regulate the way that a griever can experience their grief so how when for how long um, and yes you see it in terms of of this um, so disenfranchised grief can look like dismissive comments like you know um, you're still young you can have another baby or be glad that you're still alive or something like it was only an animal it was only a pet um, and then it goes to another extent where people can simply ignore the loss and the grief altogether so not acknowledge it at all mm, okay that makes sense um and i think i used this example in the in the other episode as well but um you know culturally there's certain rights for instance that you know some of the religions have to go through and i think over the last two years as an example you know with covid you couldn't really do that and you know you saw these like really um you know heard these really disturbing stories where you know people couldn't almost like do the last rites for people and that was like such a you know it was such a big thing but it was um, you know when, when you when you were speaking there i couldn't help but think of that as well as an example you know where you almost like don't let the people go through their normal grieving process um you know with that but uh, tell me so what happens if you don't do that well what happens if you're forcing someone not to go through the grieving process i, I still find it weird that we say force because I mean, in my mind, I still can't understand how would you force someone uh, unless it's more subtle force? Yes, I think it's more of not allowing, you know, rather than forcing, it's more of a not allowing space for someone else's grief, someone else's pain and their expression of that. Um, you know, so if I think about it quite simply, I think that people feel quite uncomfortable around grief. You know the the sadness and the pain of another person it makes people feel uncomfortable and awkward um so people try to make that i think they try to you know ease that discomfort and and also the helplessness that you can feel when someone else is in pain you know you want to make it better you want them to be okay um so people can either try to make it better or they can minimize the experience you know it's not so bad or you'll get over it um, or like I said before, simply ignoring it. Um, but I think it does come down to that. I think it comes down to the discomfort that we feel around grief, around death, around pain of other people. Mm. So in terms, of, um, in terms of why that happens, do you have any thoughts on why do people feel that way around grief? Because one would think that, you know, we as a as a society or as a you know as a people you know we we should be pretty used to this over centuries and generations but obviously we're not mm. is there any thoughts around that well i do have some thoughts yes you know i think i think you're right i i share that with you you know death has been you know part of human existence since we started existing we live and and, and we die that is the reality of our existence um, but I think that has changed in, in recent years, um, you know, with, with the modernization of the world, you know, the developments of technology, um, the moving away from, from those things that are, I guess, more human, you know, more natural, shall we say. Um, death has become a lot more medicalized. We've become quite distant from it. It's not as part of our daily lives as it, as it may have been, you know, 100 years ago. We're not faced with it all the time or you know i think before the pandemic the pandemic has definitely brought death to the forefront but you know we've become quite from my perspective quite disconnected from that 
Um, and it, it is more, you know, a case of trying to avoid that. And the crux of it, I think, is fear. You know, we fear our own mortality and we fear being reminded of our own mortality. Not only that, you know, when we see someone that maybe we care about who's lost a significant person to them, somewhere for us, we can fear that we, you know, that's possible for us too. You know, the only thing that separates from me from having experienced that loss is luck, you know, is, you know, it could have been me. And that's really, really scary, I think, for people. You know, Beanie, I, I love that you put it that way is, you know, firstly, we don't deal with death on an everyday, daily kind of basis because it is so medicalized now and invariably people tend to die in hospital or or through tragic or traumatic circumstances and I think something else that plays a very big role in people not understanding or actually being comfortable around someone grieving is very simply because they haven't gone through a loss or that they actually don't understand what's happening so they, they don't understand that feeling of my world is falling apart or I don't know if I'm going to be able to get up and carry on without my significant other or, you know, a, a parent that's lost a child. How do they get up and continue being a parent to the remaining children? With So I think that plays a very big role with the whole grief cycle and why people tend to push it to one side is they simply don't understand it because they haven't experienced it. Um, mm. Do you find that that could also be a reason that we tend to make comments like, you know, they're in a better place or, you know, at least you're still here and, mm. you know, that you're still young, there, there is chance to carry on with your life. Would that be part of the reason people tend to make those kind of comments trying to help? Absolutely. I think you're, you're right. You know, if we think, uh, again, 100 years ago, um, we would have experienced losses a lot more frequently and maybe a lot earlier in life, whereas now uh, development of, of technology, of medicine, you know, we can be in our 50s when we experience our first loss you know the loss of a parent or or maybe the loss of a grandparent we're living longer and so we're experiencing loss later in life so absolutely i think that that could be a factor where people simply can't relate and in order to try and relate to try and empathize with someone we have to imagine that possibility for ourselves you know we have to be able to put ourselves in someone's shoes if we haven't experienced it ourselves we have to imagine what would it be like for me to lose that person to me, you know, my parents, my child, my partner, what, what must that be like? You know, we have to be able to do that in order to imagine someone else's lived experience. And that is exceptionally difficult to do. Again, fear, discomfort, and then the helplessness. You know, I think that many of the things that, that are said, like those phrases that you mentioned, they can be well-intentioned. I, I, I like to believe that they often are, you know, they come from a good place. They come from a place of care, of, of wanting to ease their, the person they care about suffering, you know, um, and also not knowing what to say. And the thing is that, you know, the more and more we, we become death avoidant, we become grief, grief avoidant, death denying, you know, we don't talk about death, it's taboo. We don't talk about the experience of grief. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mood killer. It's, um, oh, it's a, it's a downer topic. You know, we don't talk about it. It becomes that, that separation becomes more and more and more. It becomes harder and harder for us to relate, to empathize and, and to think, you know, geez, could that be hurtful? Could it be hurtful to say something that that's well intended to me? You know, could that be received in a way that's, that's seen as insensitive to someone who's just lost, you know, someone that they love dearly. Um, and it's these kinds of conversations that make us privy to that, to that kind of knowledge to think, geez, you know, I always say that I always say it, you know, they're in a better place. 
And, and maybe that's because I believe that they are, but what if the other person doesn't? You know, what if, what if that's actually not comforting, you know, even though it's intended to be? Mm. I think you mentioned two really strong points and it was, you know, I was making notes just now and, uh, and that's exactly what I thought was people live longer. So that was the first point. And like you said, um, you know, I think probably a few generations back, yeah, you know, people probably lived until their 30s, 40s. So it's almost like that, you know, as the next person is becoming an adult, you know, the, the previous generation almost is not there and that's okay. But with, you know, medical advancement, you know, people are living longer. So you're getting to see people, um, you know, through that life. Um, but that raises other issues. But the one point I want to mention, which is what you just t touched on now, you know, when we say things like, you know, they're in a better place is, do you find that it has a different almost, I wouldn't say meaning, but, you know, there's something different about people that are more religious or non-religious? Because, you know, one would think that, you know, most religious faiths tell us that, um, you know, you, they're going to be in a better place, you know? So one would think that you celebrate that. So like there's, I don't know if you ever watched the movie Avatar, but you know, like when someone dies, I mean, you know, like there's this whole like beautiful, you know, thing about them going back to, you know, to the earth and stuff like that. And it was like more a celebration than a, than a grieving process. But do you find, do you have any thoughts around that? Hmm. You know, I think it does depend on the individual. It's going to change from from case to case and the importance i think isn't on you know it shouldn't be on is the person religious or not as in is this going to hold meaning for them or not right do they do they believe that i think that it's about following the grievers lead you know if if someone is in unimaginable pain that someone that they love dearly has just died you know, they're still trying to come to terms with the fact that, that their person is dead. It, it's, you know, something that they can't comprehend. Maybe that isn't the right timing. You know, maybe that's something for two years down the line to say, you know, or, or what do you think? Do you think, you know, that they're in a better place? Because, you know, that's what brings me comfort. I think it's about, you know, following the grievers lead, seeing, uh, posing it as a question rather than as a, you know, as a, truth statement um because yes it can have it can value it can have meaning and i don't want to detract from that but not always you know i think especially with phrases that are recycled you know reused things that everyone says you know someone dies you say i'm so sorry for your loss um you know they at least they're not in pain anymore at least they're in a better place and you know sending positive vibes and love and light you know you can you can think of all the the phrases that we we all turn to that we all say when we don't know what to say and and the problem with that when we're recycling when we're reusing these phrases they can they can lose that impact they can lose the the meaning so again i think it's about timing about following the person's lead you know is this something that you find helpful are you religious? You know, do you take comfort in your beliefs right now? Is that something that I can offer you right now? Um, and, and approaching it like that rather than just putting it on the griever, you know? Yeah, the reason I said that and um, was, you know, when you mentioned like almost the subtle pressure, it's, um, you know, if someone and I've noticed this, you know, a few times, but, uh, you know, like when you in that type of scenario, and if you supposedly, you know, sharing this, you know, like this belief, then it almost like creates this pressure on you to actually then be, you know, like you shouldn't be that sad because they are in a better place. So why would you be, you know, be upset because I'm going to, you're just going to see them just now. But it doesn't, it, exactly. it almost minimizes, you know, that grieving process that's there. So it sets up this expectation and I think I was resonating with that point, you know, you said earlier. So it's not like forced pressure, but it's definitely the subtle pressure that you should, it's almost like you should know better, you know, kind of thing. Exactly. Um, exactly. That's the second part of the sentence. You know, that's the, the, the part that doesn't get said, you know, that they're in a better place. So you should be okay. You know, you, you shouldn't be so sad. You, you know, you should be pulling yourself together because, because of that. Yes. And, and that's exactly it. It, it can be 
minimizing. It can make the griever feel like, you know, what I'm experiencing in this moment is not okay. And it's not safe here. I can't, I can't express my grief in this space because people just tell me that, oh, it's not that bad, you know, or you'll be together again. So hush, hush, it's fine. But oftentimes it is that bad. You know, there, there, there is no silver lining. There is no pretty rainbow in that moment. Yeah, yeah. I love the way that you say that. It's because the last thing you want to do is minimize somebody's experience of whether it be grief or joy or, you know, you need to let a person experience these to be able to deal with the complications of something like grief. So just going on that train of thought, you know, what would be some of the psychological factors of disenfranchised grief, you know, not allowing a person to properly experience and go through that grieving process? So the impact of disenfranchising someone else's grief can be incredibly damaging. You know, when a person is already suffering after losing someone that they love, it can be so confusing and, and isolating when the people around them aren't recognizing their loss is significant. You know, they're not recognizing that this is, is huge for you, you know, that losing this person or, you know, they stigmatize the way that you express your grief, you know, either it's always, it, it's always, you know, not too much, not too little, you know, don't cry too much, but don't cry too little. Um, you know, and, and we stigmatize how people experience that gr their, their grief. And, you know, when you're grieving, it's not scripted. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's natural. It's, it's however you respond to that loss. It's your natural response. And, and it can be so confusing when people just don't seem to get it. When people seem to, to not understand, or like, well, why are you grieving? You know, that, that your relationship with them wasn't that good, or you weren't that close, you know, or, but you're crying so much, you know, this isn't normal, something's wrong. Um, it can be really confusing. Um, when people don't recognize grief, or they invalidate, invalidate and they minimize that experience, they won't understand that this person actually needs support. Um, and then the griever can experience little to no social support. And that is so in, so important when you are grieving is social support. You know, I think grief is already a lonely experience. You, there's no way around that, you know, because even if you and I lost the same person, our experiences of it would be different because our relationships to that person are different. They're unique. They're unique to your personality, mine and theirs, you know, so our experiences won't be the same. Um, so it is lonely in that sense, but it's so important to have social support in, in these, you know, in these moments of life when, when the suffering is great and disenfranchised grief pretty much takes away that support, um, which can make it difficult to connect with people and also manage or maintain existing relationships. You know, when it feels like your grief is going unacknowledged, um, it's, it's invalidated, it's minimized, it's unsupported, but it's very real for you. It's not something that you can just switch off and say, okay, um, you know, people aren't supporting me on this. So, you know what, I think I'll just, I'll just park it. I'll just put it aside. Maybe some people can do that, but I, I don't think a lot, you know, or for very long. So then what happens is that people can start feeling a lot of shame around their experience, a lot of shame around their grief. They feel misunderstood, you know, isolated, minimized and validated. And, and then that, that results in people starting to question their own reality. You know, is there something wrong with me? Is, is my experience actually not as bad as I think it is? Am I, am I overreacting to this? You know, should I not be grieving at all? You know, then we can see, you know, further effects like depression, anxiety, um, you know, withdrawing from society or people. We see psychosomatic illnesses, so physical symptoms and low self-esteem. It's important here, though, that to note that a lot of these things are common in grief 
anyway. But this is specifically when, you know, the grief that is being experienced or the loss that, that happened is not being acknowledged. It's not being seen as real. It's not being validated. Um, it's being unacknowledged or ignored or minimized. So just going on that train of thought is, you know, in South Africa, there are a lot of rights and so on for the LGBTQI plus community. But on the same hand, there's also a lot of you know, conservative nature and that kind of thing. So I would think then that in that case, somebody that could be going through disenfranchised grief could be a member of the LGBTQ community who's now lost their partner, but nobody really acknowledges the importance of that loss because they never, in the to begin with, acknowledged the relationship. So that person is now left to try and pick up the pieces afterwards with absolutely no support structure because the relationship was never acknowledged. Or, you know, even in a South African context, if you look at interracial couples, they, they, they could also be in a position where the relationship itself is not supported by their support structure. So when a partner passes, they don't have that support from the family. Is that where that disenfranchised grief kind of more often than not comes in of just that, oh, well, we told you not to marry that person. So, you know, it's really neither here nor there that they have passed. So the family doesn't feel the loss, but the person themselves does. Absolutely. And that is, that's one of the, the reasons, shall we say, for disenfranchised grief is that the relationship is devalued or is not seen as significant. Um, so if the relationship with the, the person who's passed, the deceased, is not recognized, then yes, the, the person who's left behind, the, the spouse or the, 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 you know, the, the partner, um, yes, they, their grief goes unacknowledged, unrecognized, because that relationship wasn't seen as significant. It's very different if, if we can acknowledge you know, your partner, your spouse, and then you lose your partner, your spouse, then that grief can be acknowledged. But if we don't recognize the, the, the relationship, then it's, then it's almost, you know, when we talk about taking away that right or that privilege to grieve, um, that's where we see that happening, where it's, well, you, you don't have a right to grieve because that person wasn't your spouse. That person, you know, uh, we didn't recognize the relationship that you had as being intimate or loving or caring or deep or profound, you know, so your loss isn't recognized as such. Hmm. It's such an interesting question that uh, she has mentioned and that train of thought. Uh, we were actually, um, so my wife's um, uncle is down from the US and uh, we were just talking about a family member that she remembers, but it was, you know, quite a fond uncle of theirs. But um, he was definitely, um, um, yeah, he, uh, it was almost like he was never married. So everyone assumed, you know, like he, he just never got married. And, you know, and they, it just turns out that actually he was, um, yeah, he, you know, like he, he definitely had someone in his life, but no one knew it. So it was almost like this, you know, like this undercover kind of thing. And it, mm. it's interesting that years later, you know, they realized that actually it was like, you know, it was depression. You know, when you look back at, you know, how he was functioning and all of those things. And, uh, and it's interesting, you know, hearing you mm. speak about how that almost has a ripple effect. And it's these things that for, you know, for centuries or, you know, generations, we almost like didn't acknowledge and now we're forced to mm. um, and how yes. that affects people, you know, which is also the amazing thing about the world that we're living in. You know, there's these things that are just coming up at the moment and, you know, we're forced as a society to sometimes deal with it, um, which is nice. But um, I did want to ask uh, Beanie, I mean, how does someone know that they're going through disenfranchised grief I mean is it I mean like this is such a term that I mean and that's why I said you know at the beginning of the show it's amazing that we're covering this because one of the reasons we we do the show is um is to almost make those terms that we don't really know you know to to be in a much more layman's terms available to us and um you know if someone had to go in 
onto Google, they're not going to search for disenfranchised grief. There's no way, mm. you know, it's like, mm. just doesn't happen. But how, if mm. you had to say from a psychologist pers perspective, how would someone know that? Mm. I think that's a really, really important question. I think that, you know, a good way to know is when we, when we start to look at the way that the people around us are responding to our loss and our grief, it can be difficult because you know, you're in many ways, you know, your world has just come crashing down. Um, the last thing that you're thinking about is how, how are people responding to me? You know, it, it's more like this is, you know, what, what is happening for me and it's very overwhelming. But if we start to take note of how people are responding to us and then in turn, how that makes us feel, you know, so for example, if someone offered the, the phrase that we, we spoke about earlier, you know, um, they're in a better place and it makes you feel better. It makes you feel comforted. It makes you feel, yeah, okay, you know, that that's true and it's really helpful for me, you know, to, to be able to think about that, then, then maybe not. But if you're feeling, oh, hang on a second, you know, that, that doesn't, sit right that makes me feel like i can't speak to you about my grief it makes me feel like my grief is not welcome here um you know it makes me feel like there's something wrong with me or that i shouldn't be feeling this way or um that i'm supposed to be better or get better you know i think that's important information to realize okay so the people around me aren't necessarily acknowledging my experience the way that it is as in, you know, the way that I'm experiencing it. Um, so I think that is really, really important when we start to feel like our, our experience of grief is being invalidated or it's being minimized or ignored. You know, I think that's, that's one that's very easy to recognize when people ignore our grief because, you know, when someone we love has died, yes, we get the influx of messages, right? And maybe it's it's people all saying the same thing and you know but it's maybe on some level we wish it was different you know we wish they were saying more saying something more real something more authentic but at the same time we appreciate that they're acknowledging our loss and then we start to notice the people who don't we start to notice the messages that don't come through the people we expect to contact us you know to share some words of of sympathy of, of some comfort it's it becomes quite acute in fact to notice that and the disappointment that you feel as a result that this person didn't acknowledge my loss didn't offer support um and and that is a good indicator of of being of you know is my experience being disenfranchised um so yes if i think i have to summarize it it's it's, it's how you're feeling about the response of people do you feel invalidated do you, do you feel minimized? Does it feel like people around you are ignoring your grief? Are they stigmatizing your loss? You know, are they stigmatizing the way that you express your grief? Oh. And, and that's all feedback for you to know, okay, my experience might be being disenfranchised. Hmm. I think you just took the conversation up a few levels there, because that is, uh, that is amazing what you just said in terms of, you know, um, firstly, knowing how you know like how um how you feeling you know and, and what that impact is because i think that's a key thing that you know anyone listening to this has to realize i mean you're the most important person so it's about how you experiencing it and i think what you said there which is actually so true is that you know people um and someone told me this once before as well it was around the funeral and she said you know it's not about that time it's about the month after that, you know, when everything is quiet and you don't get those messages and you're not, you know, every, everyone is not around. And it's like you just said now, you know, it's like then you start self-reflecting and saying, oh, actually, I, you know, firstly, that person didn't send me a message or, or the people that did send me a message, I didn't like the message that they were telling me or, you know, like, and, and it's interesting how that works out. Um, and the reason I say, you, you know, you took it up a few levels is because I think from a how it affects different people is is different because again you know it's going to be unique to the circumstance unique to the person but where i want to go with this as well is that and i asked Bronwyn this you know in the other episode around bereavement is do you find it's different depending on whether it was in the natural order of things or not 
And by that, I mean, you know, when you lose a parent, especially if the parent's been sick, you know, you kind of expect, okay, cool, you know, that, that makes sense and there's that, that semblance to it. But losing a child or a sibling or something like that, I mean, that can't be, you know, like, and again, there's this expectation around it. And, but I want to ask, I mean, is there any way that someone could almost like, I wouldn't say prepare, but almost like, you know, like, do you find that people, there's a different expectation on grief depending on who passes away? So it's the first part of your question, can people prepare? Um, unfortunately not, I think is the honest question, uh, the honest answer to that. You know, you can, you can think you're preparing. You can consciously say, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating this loss. I'm anticipating that this person will die. But the sad reality is that nothing can prepare you for that moment. Nothing can prepare you for the moment when your loved one's heart stops beating, they stop breathing and they're dead. Um, nothing can prepare for you for how you'll respond to that. You know, as I said before, you know, grief is not something that's scripted. It's not something that you choose. It's not something that you say, okay, you know, this is how I want to respond. It's, na it's, it's your natural response to the loss of someone that you love so nothing can prepare you for that um to be honest i think you know you and, and maybe maybe listeners would like to know that it is possible to prepare but I, I don't think i would be be fully honest in saying that it is the second part of the question um if i understood correctly was around hierarchies of loss so Yes, did I yeah, yeah. that correctly? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and there's a different feeling to like a you know a parent losing a child as opposed to a child losing a parent, and I just find that you know there's there's almost like that suddenness or, or or something just doesn't feel right. And I think when you speak to people as well, you know, most people would say, you know, I'm okay with you know like a almost like you know the child, um, you know, like if it's the parent, but you know if it's a child, it's almost like the whole natural order and there's that suddenness of it um, that I just wonder, you know, like, is there anything around that that makes that more susceptible to disenfranchised grief, you know, uh, from, a, from that perspective? Mm. So, yes, I mean, I, I think I think all losses are susceptible to disenfranchised grief. Um, obviously, there are lists of, you know, the whys, the reasons um, that that certain losses or, or certain experiences of grief get disenfranchised. But that is one way, you know, where we, you know, if you're losing your parents, the expectation is, well, that, like you said, it's, it's the natural order of things. That's how things are supposed to be. So maybe your experience shouldn't be as profound. But there, but it doesn't quite work that way. You know, to be honest, yes, we, the losses that we can experience are different, but it's, I don't think it's different in terms of, well, was it your parents or was it your child? Because, you know, if it was your parents, it can't have been as bad as losing your child. Um, I think they, they're both bad, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's about trying to decide, well, well, which one is worse, you know, they're all bad. Um, and none of them are good. Um, and I think once we start, you know, playing that game, it, it does become very easy to disenfranchise another's grief, you know, because while well, my experience is worse because I lost a child, whereas you lost your parents, so it's not as bad. But, you know, we grief can't be compared. In all honesty, we can't compare each other's experiences. I think, you know, on some level, we need to accept that it is all bad. Yes, they will be different they'll be different, you know, because for me, it's about the relationship. The relationship between a parent and a child is different. Between a partner and a partner is different. You know, the relationships are what make the experience of loss different, but not necessarily better or worse, if that makes sense. You know, it, it does. It makes complete sense because I think the most important thing you said there is that you actually can't compare loss. Um, even if you've got two, two people who both lost siblings, their experience of that loss is going to be very different based on, like you said, the relationship with the siblings. I mean, if it's a sibling that you 
hardly know or that experience is going to be very different to siblings that are really, really close because the relationship differs. So I think that's the important thing for people to take away from this is regardless of what the loss is, is that everybody's going to experience it in their own way. But more importantly, that it's the relationship that they're grieving. It's the loss of that. And that could be different. You could have five siblings in a house who've lost one sibling and all the, the remaining four are all going to experience that loss differently based on the relationship with the sibling that's no longer there. So I don't think we should have hierarchies. I don't think there should be the concept of it is the natural order. I do, however, understand, though, that you do seem to process the loss of a grandparent a little bit better than you might process the loss of a parent. and But that's because of the relationship, not necessarily because, well, your grandparents have lived a nice to a nice ripe old age. It's just a different relationship. Am I, am I understanding that correctly yes. as the way you were phrasing it? Yes, okay. I, I would completely ag agree with that. And I think the important thing there is not for us to decide for the griever, you know, what their relationship was. It's, it's for the griever to decide, you know, instead of us saying, well, it was your grandparents. So it wasn't, it couldn't have been that bad. Right. It's for the griever to say, well, you know, um, I actually didn't have a very close relationship with them. I didn't know them very well. Or, well, you might see my grandmother, but that was like a mom to me. You know, mm. she she played role of mom to me. So actually, that loss is a lot more significant for me um, than, than, you know, a relationship with a, you know, a, an estranged grandmother. So I think what the really important thing there is for the griever to define that rather than for us as outsiders you know us as uh you know parts of society to decide for the griever oh grand grandmother grandchild that's that's not a significant relationship uh this relationship this one that is you know so it has to come from the griever because they know the the intricacies of their relationships with their loved ones hmm I like that. I, I think we bring that point across very really nicely. And I think, Vinny, you're doing a really, yeah, I think you're emphasizing that really nicely for us and for anyone listening to it. And, um, you know, just to close up the discussion also, you know, from the from the episode around bereavement, if you can almost help us through this as well. So what what would be the difference between just normal bereavement and disenfranchised grief? Hmm. So those terms are quite different. It's, it's actually quite a, a simple delineation. So bereavement differs from disenfranchised grief in that bereavement is the experience of losing with someone, uh, someone that we love. So we become bereaved through the death of a loved one. So bereavement is that experience of losing someone to death. And disenfranchised grief is the response that others have to the grief that we experience after someone we love dies. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Um, but yeah, I think you defined it really well. But uh, and, and in practical terms, I mean, like if you had to you know, like paint two scenarios for us, I mean, for, you know, to explain it maybe in detail, would you be able to do that? Of course. So, for example, um, I am bereaved because I lost a friend. So I have become bereaved through their death. And that's bereavement, the experience of them dying. My Grief becomes disenfranchised then when I start to to grieve the loss of that friend. And people start to say, but it was just a friend. So you weren't related by blood. So, um, you know, do you really do you really have a right to grieve here? You know, if you were the mom or you were the sister, then it would be different. But you're just a friend. So do you really have a right to grieve here? And, um, you know, well, maybe that rec that relationship isn't worth recognizing. Um, and maybe you're not so deserving of that support because you were just a friend. Um, and, and that's then when we start to see the grief being disenfranchised, when the relationship isn't recognized or when the, the griever is not given the opportunity 
to grieve, to publicly or openly grieve their loss. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. I think you brought that that point quite nicely home. I think that's that's amazing. Um, when Shaz and I were discussing, you know, the, uh, you know how we would approach the episode, and you know, one of the things we also discussed was, you know, can you grieve something other than that? And I think, uh, you know, was a question, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. So my research focused specifically on grief as a result of death. And, and many do think of grief, grief as being the experience of losing a loved one. But we can grieve any kind of loss. So grief is the natural response to loss. And life is filled with a wide variety of kinds of losses. You know, some losses may be easier to see and name. Others are harder to recognize. They can be temporary, they can be permanent, they can be minor inconveniences, or they can be life-changing. So each loss will affect the, the, the person differently. You know, losses can be experienced in all aspects of our being, and they can all result in the experience of grief. So other losses that we can experience um, that aren't necessarily as a result of death can be, you know, the, the loss of a, of a relationship to someone who's living, you know, the end of a relationship, the, the, a divorce, um, the end of that kind of partnership. It can be the loss of a job, loss of income, loss of health. You know, when we're diagnosed with something, when we're diagnosed with a, an illness and we, we lose our sense of health, our sense of life as we once knew it. Um, so, yes, we can grieve any kind of loss. So just following on that train of thought then, it would then make sense that those losses could also result in disenfranchised grief. You know, that similar concept of, yeah, but you know, they weren't good for you, which is why the relationship ended. And so they kind of play down the fact that a relationship ending is actually a loss or they play down the, you know, yeah, but he was a cheating, you know, he cheated on you. And so you shouldn't be upset that this is over. They diminishing the loss that that person could be feeling. And that in itself can then create that disenfranchised grief cycle again, that, you know, anxiety, social awkwardness and depression over the fact that, you know, why am I so upset that, we've, I've had this divorce, you know, it wasn't a good marriage. It wasn't all of this, but, and you feeling that way because society is telling you, you actually shouldn't be upset about this marriage ending, but you're actually, you've lost a piece of, or a part of your life as you knew it. 100%. And I, and I think that's, what's so important about disenfranchised grief, because, you know, like I said, my focus is specifically on disenfranchised grief after losing a loved one to death. Mm. But there are many reasons that grief gets disenfranchised. So, you know, what you're speaking about is where the, the loss isn't seen as significant, or so it's devalued. And, and we can see that in, in terms of death as well, like the, the loss of a pet um, that can be seen as insignificant or devalued, or like you're saying, the loss of a, a relationship. Although that can be, you know, that loss tends to be ambiguous. You know, when we see that a, a a loss is not being caused by death, but rather a breakup or a divorce. Um, or like I said, you know, health, mobility, safety, these are all things that we can lose. And these all fall under the, the reasons that, that grief gets disenfranchised. Mm. I want to push the point a little bit more, and I, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but do you see loss as in any way connected to regret as well? Because sometimes, you know, you lose the opportunity, you know, so, so there's that loss part, but then there's that regret part. And, and I think obviously this comes up a lot with death as well. You know, it's amazing how you always remember the one thing that you should have done, you know, like we were supposed to go for dinner and we didn't and then something happened, you know, and stuff, stuff like that. Do you find anything related to that come up? Absolutely. So I would term that as, you know, we, we grieve the path untraveled. So, you know, if we think about life and all the and all the paths that life take take us takes us on on the daily, you know, so for example, like that, you know, we were supposed to go for dinner. That was a, a path untraveled. That was 
the road we could have gone down, but for whatever the circumstances didn't, you know, maybe we canceled or maybe that's the night that something terrible happened. And, and then we start to grieve not only the loss that we've experienced, but the path untraveled, the life unlived, um, you know, the parts that we, we expected, the moments we expected to share, but couldn't or didn't. Um, so a hundred percent, but I would frame it, you know, of course that we experience that as regret and, and, but it's also a form of grief, you know, we, and it, it forms a part of that process is, you know, both with and without death, we, we grief, we grieve for the path untraveled, the life unlived. And she has, so, um, you know, the one thing, um, I, uh, by the way, I love that, Sarah Bini. I mean, like, uh, the one thing we find with all of the, um, um, the guests that we have on, they always have these amazing sayings. And I think for, for me, being that's your one, um, is uh, we grieve the, the path untraveled. I love that. Um, I've never heard anyone say that in those words, but it actually makes so much sense. Um, you know, for me, coming from a technology point of view, I always, we were actually talking about it this weekend as well in a, at a family uh, dinner. And we were saying, it's almost like you want to simulate things. It's like, I wonder if, you know, we went down that path, what would happen? And, you know, in life, you don't get that chance. You know, you, you make, a, make a decision, you go down a path and, you know, you deal with the consequences. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, maybe you're fortunate enough to, to, do that, uh, do, to do something differently if you wanted to. But most of the time, you know, you pick the path. But I love that, that saying from you. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that always comes in retrospect, right? It, it's, it's, it's these moments that you maybe, maybe you take a bit for granted because you expect to have more of them or whatever the case may be, you know, you expect that there will be other opportunities, other options. And it's only in retrospect that you can look back and say, oh, damn, maybe I should have, maybe I should have done that. Or I, if only we'd had that last dinner together, you know, maybe things, maybe I would have felt differently. And I think, you know, once we once we recognize that and we we come to hold the reality and the inevitability of our mortality of of our own demise and that of the people that we care and love about you know we care for and we love we we can start to live life in a more authentic way you know we can start to appreciate those moments we can start to say I was going to cancel dinner, but you know what? Let's go. Let's go for dinner because you never know when it could be the last one. Um, and, and sort of, yeah, live in a, a life in a way that makes you more authentic, more vulnerable with the people that you care about and the people that you love. Pini, I, I love that you mentioned it that way and, and you know, that, that path not traveled. But I think there's another side to this as well. So, we lost my baby sister 15 years ago. So there's certain milestones that kind of come across and I can see my mother struggles with some of them. So for example, my one niece's 21st birthday is coming up and it hits my mom a little bit hard. And again, it's because she never got to plan a 21st birthday for my sister. And a lot of the family are going, you know, why are you, and it's exactly that. It's, I never got to do a 21st for this child. Or, you know, I remember when I got engaged, as happy as my mother was that I got engaged, you could also see that thought of this, my other child is never going to get there. There's never going to be the wedding. There's never going to be grandchildren. There's, so that, kind, that grief carries on throughout the remainder of the surviving person's life and sometimes kind of gets pushed aside when you're going, but I mean, come on, really, why are you upset at your niece's graduation? Well, you know, because it's something I always saw doing with my child that's never been there. And I think sometimes we can disenfranchise somebody's grief because we're going, but yeah. And so, yeah, it's sometimes the path not traveled, but I think sometimes also it's the, it's the life we envisioned that just never plays out. And I think that especially happens with parents that have lost a child, because mm -hmm. there are things that every parent, I assume, hopes to have with their children, you know, the 21st birthday, the 30th birthday, the 40th birthday, mm -hmm. you know, 
getting engaged, getting married, the firstborn child, and suddenly that's no longer there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I think that that's a, it's, it's a, a beautiful example of two things. You mentioned two things that I think that are so important there. You know, the one is the time frame. You know, socially in society, we, we have these social norms around grief and around how long it should last. And, you know, if you're lucky, you get six months to a year really lucky you get two years but after that um, you know the expectation is that you should no longer be grieving the reality is very different you know grief lasts as long as that po- the person who has passed away remains important to you and if that person is going to remain important to you if you're going to love that person for the rest of your life then then grief will last for the rest of your life and the intensity can subside you know in time it may not be as overwhelming as intense um as the you know first few years maybe are but it remains and we see it in in those life events you know in the life events that we expected to share together you know like you you mentioned with your mom never having the opportunity to to throw a 21st birthday party for your sister but having envisioned that for for all of you you know for her for your sister for all of you um and it's the same with any kind of loss, any life event, any major moment in your life that that person was going to be there for, should have been there for, is going to be hard. Those are going to be moments of grieving. You know, um, I lost my father. My father will never walk me down the aisle if I get married. You know, the, the loss will always be there in our significant moments in our lives. And that's because that person remains important to us. So that's the one important thing that you mentioned is in, around the time frame of grief, that maybe there is no time frame, that maybe there is no time limits, that, that it's okay for us to be grieving as, as long as we love the person, you know, that yes, and, and, and that does di- get disenfranchised when it doesn't get recognized. And it's maybe been, you know, 20 odd years later and people are going, why are you still sad about this? And not really understanding why um, and that it's actually completely normal. And then the other thing that you mentioned was the continuation of relationships. And I think that that's so important. You know, yes, our grief, our experience of grief, our response to the loss is going to be determined by the relationship that we had with the person. Our experience is as unique as that relationship. And another social norm that we seem to have is that when somebody we love dies, you know, so does that connection with them. And it's almost that the expectation that we should somehow you know put them in the past you know that relationship comes to an end and 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 that's seen as as healthy you know healthy where you um you cut your cords you cut your bonds with the person who has died and you somehow you know move on with life without this person but the reality again is very different you know we continue our relationships with people who have died um you know we do that through ritual we do that through talking about them through remembering them and and that again is unique to us we have to figure out what does our relationship look like with this person now that no longer physically here um but i think that's so important to remember that just because your person has died it doesn't mean that the relationship with them has died and it doesn't mean that you can't continue that relationship with them in a way that feels right for you you know however that looks for you hmm. you know though when you mentioned that um, i can't help but think you know there's there's always people that that visit the tomb um or the tombstone like you know years later and sometimes it's even part of their ritual you know every year to take you know flowers to you know to the graveside and it's would that be one of the examples of like always like remembering them or keeping them top of mind it could be you know i think ritual is so important in in grief you know in maybe in the you know when it's not so overwhelming maybe not in the early days months and years but ritual is so important to help keep connected to that person for some people it does look like that and that is more of a socially accepted thing to do isn't it to to visit someone's grave sites or their tomb and to place flowers maybe on significant dates maybe on you know birthdays or anniversaries or, or death of death anniversaries or death anniversaries um 
but yes that that is a ritual that that helps keep the relationship alive that is more socially acceptable then we see the ones that that aren't seen as socially acceptable and can be you know disenfranchised seen as abnormal you know seen as strange or weird you know um uh but you know like for example some people will keep their the the loved one's clothes maybe they'll make pillows out of their loved one's clothes maybe they'll do something like that maybe they'll have a, a big photo of the loved one in the house with you know some some um artifacts of the person you know significant items of the person or that you shared in the relationship or you know and and these rituals are so important for us keeping that relationship with the person but often get seen as um you know abnormal they get um disenfranchised yeah hmm i like that um so i want to come to and you know maybe we could have done it sooner but um in terms of a psychologist uh, or someone coming to you and let, let's assume they they're pretty enlightened and they do know that they're struggling with disenfranchised grief how would a psychologist normally help them through that process um would be the first part you know to that and then the second one is you know, and maybe it's related very closely, but what happens if you don't see a psychologist or what happens if you don't process this grief, you know, what, um, what do you see mm -hmm. from that? So when people do come to therapy, you know, I think a big part of it, a big, big part of seeing people who are experiencing disenfranchised grief is to validate their experience to validate whatever it is that that is happening for them and i mean that in terms of emotions in terms of you know behaviors in terms of physical reactions responses to to the loss validation is so key when the people around them are invalidating and minimizing oftentimes it is just about providing a space where someone can openly grieve honestly authentically grieve you know not not scripted not um yeah, you know how people expect you to put on this face you know to lie almost to to put on a face that doesn't match what you're experiencing in your heart so it can be so important to provide a space for someone where they can take off that mask where there aren't any social expectations you know there are no rules on how they can express their grief or what they can say or what they can't say and so importantly where there's no judgment you know it's so important that there, there is that space where they can be with their grief authentically without experiencing judgment without it being minimized where it can be validated and you know i think i spend a lot of time normalizing the experience as well it's almost like um you know and i, I say this i say this lightly but it's almost like working against what people are being told on the outside you know Oh, it's still it's six months and you're still grieving something's wrong with you and uh, you know it's almost it's almost countering that and, and normalizing the experience normalizing so much of the experience because so i think a lot of it does get misunderstood a lot of it does get minimized and invalidated and ignored um so i guess the main thing is about creating a safe space of non-judgment where where the griever can express themselves authentically and they can be validated their experience can be normalized um and th and then we speak about things like you know how how to maintain your relationship with your loved one what does that look like for you what do you want it to look like what's special for you what was special for you and, and them together you know what works for you because i think that's something else that we miss you know like we've sort of touched on in our conversation today nobody really asks the griever you know is is this what works for you if i tell you that you know they're in a better place now is that what works for you um so it can be just about asking them what works for you what do you need you know um so i guess that is a, a quick sort of summary of what therapy could look like or what um what i might do with someone who comes to me with disenfranchised grief um and the second part of your question what happens what happens if you don't allow yourself to grieve if i understood that correctly 100 percent. so yeah. so when grievers aren't given permission to experience their grief either by others or themselves it can be really difficult to adapt to and process the loss you know a lot of a lot of grieving is adapting to the new reality you know this reality that doesn't include your person physically 
it's about you know accepting that and, and adapting to that you know so that is a process in itself you know coming to terms with that and and, and trying to understand what does my life look like without this person who am I without this person? You know, we lose someone's significance. You know, we, we lose the role of, of wife, of partner, of daughter, of uh, son. You know, we lose that role. And, and then we, we come to question, you know, oh, who am I without this person? So when we don't allow ourselves the experience of grieving, it can be very difficult to adapt to that and process the loss. Healthy grief is what we experience when we allow ourselves to feel the pain of our loss. So when we take time to, you know, identify and understand what we're feeling and and over time, you know, come to terms with that, come to terms with what's happened, even though that pain may never go away, you know, we, we, we do learn how to continue with life, you know, how we can grow around our grief rather than expect it to minimize. But we can only do that by feeling the pain. You know, we, as humans, we, we, like to, we like to intellectualize. We like to live through our intellect. You know, we plan, we plan our actions, we plan our reactions, our responses. But like I said before, grief is not like that. It's not an intellectual reaction. It's an emotional one, you know. We can't think ourselves out of grief. We have to experience it. And for that, we need to know that it's okay. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to fall apart, fall apart if that's what you need, you know. It's okay to not be okay. You don't have to be okay. Um, you know, when we tell ourselves that we're okay when we're not, it just buries the pain. Um, you try to ignore it. You, you carry on as normal. But even then, you may not be okay years down the line. Um, and, and all the while pretending to be or trying to be when we're not, it just makes it that much harder. Um, so think about it as an analogy so imagine that you've got a, an injury right you've got a an, an open wound uh, it's it's a flesh wound you know fresh it's bleeding say it's on your hand instead of letting that injury heal you try to go about your life ignoring that it even exists and then what what happens if you ignore an open flesh wound you know before you know it it starts to fester it starts to get infected um, it starts to cause more pain, more discomfort than it was before. What could have started to heal with a little bit of care, a little bit of compassion and attention is now this big gaping wound that's going to take even longer to heal. So grieving is like tending to that flesh wound. It takes time. It takes a lot of care, you know, a lot of patience as you wait, as you wait for it to grow close. We, we, we need to tend it, we need to tend it often, we bandage it, you know, we handle it with care, we keep, we, we're careful around that area. We can expect days where it'll hurt more, where it'll sting, maybe it'll get bumped on something and it'll start bleeding again, it'll open up again, and, and you know, we have to tend to it again. So in time, that wound grows shut. And even when it grows shut, the scar remains, and that scar will be with us forever. I think that's that's the analogy that I would I would use. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's um, that's a really really uh, good way of explaining the whole thing, and I think that's amazing. Um, you know, I think for me, um, these are the type of conversations as a society we should be having because I think you know these are the difficult things that you know most people almost like window dress, and I think what you just mentioned there. I mean, uh, I can resonate with everything, you know, that you said, and I think you summed it up perfectly. So if anyone, you know, listening to this and she has, you know, it's stuff that these are the type of things that we can definitely highlight um, because I think that, you know, summarizes pretty much how we always look at it. And I like how you wrapped it up with the scar as well. It never goes away. You know, it's, uh, and if you look at the scars on your body, you know, you, there's a story with every single one. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that was quite beautiful. Um, I think we do want to wrap it up now, uh, but she has anything on your side that we should have asked Beanie uh, that we didn't? No, I think we, we've we gone through the topic quite nicely, but more importantly, I think there's that beautiful analogy at the end of what grief is and how if you tend to it properly, it does tend to heal, even though you will always be reminded by the scar 
But I think the most important takeaway was to understand that everybody, everybody experiences grief differently, but that we need to acknowledge each other's grief. And, you know, diminishing a relationship or diminishing somebody's feelings that they're going through whilst they're grieving in the long run is going to have psychological, it's going to be detrimental to this person psychologically down the line. So a little bit more empathy, a little bit more understanding and be there to help the people that you care about and love, whether or not you understand what they're grieving or why they're grieving. So Beanie, thank you. I think this has been so amazing and it's what we should be talking about. It's what society should be talking about instead of, you know, who's the latest superstar that's fallen pregnant. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. And Bini, on your side, is there anything around this topic that you thought uh, we should have asked you, but we didn't, and you find coming up with your patients and in your practice? No, I think that we've covered it quite extensively. And I, I think, you know, like, like she said, there's a, it's a really important topic. It's really important for us to think about these things, to talk about these things. And, you know, as a supporter of someone who's grieving, I think, just to be okay with not knowing, just be okay with not having the answers and and being helpless, you know, you are helpless and, and in that situation and uh, allowing the griever the opportunity to tell you what they need, you know, to ask them. If you don't understand why they're grieving, ask them, ask them, why was this so important to you? You know, I, I'd like to understand, tell me, tell me that I can see they were important, tell me why, you know? Um, I think, yeah, that that's so important. Um, but no, sorry, just to wrap it up, I, I, I think we covered, I think we covered everything quite extensively. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, although it's a difficult topic, I, I really enjoy this. And I think um, you can see your passion, you know, around the topic come out very strongly. And I think, you know, the analogies were amazing. You know, some of the terms were amazing. And I think uh, it'll definitely be one of those reference episodes for us uh, because we've quite you know, we believe quite strongly in the whole, how do we get better as, you know, as a people and a society and, mm -hmm. and everything else. So I think this is amazing. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always, stay tuned and we'll speak to you in the next episode. <music>